Hello. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everybody wherever you are in the world. That is one of the joys of uh, doing a digital program at the Africa Center is we get to invite people from all around to participate with us in some of our amazing, interesting and timely conversations on world events. So my name is Uza Dima Iwala and I'm the CEO of the Africa Center here in Harlem, New York City. And on behalf of the Africa Center, the Museum of Food and Drink and ALMA, um, we are so excited to have you join us today for this important and timely conversation featuring my friend, the Nigerian artist, chef and writer, Tunde Wei, whose work amongst many other things engages systems of exploitative power from the vantage point of the marginalized other. So at the Africa Center, our mission is to transform narratives and understanding about the role of Africa and its people in the wider world. And we're bringing this discussion to you today to expand the conversation around Africa's food security and how it relates to the impact of geopolitics and racial capitalism on food production and consumption on the continent and you know, also within the diaspora. Um, this is of course, as you know, one of the most timely things considering some of the global conflicts that we're seeing that are maybe not on the continent of Africa, but are definitely impacting how we need to think about food, food security, um, and just the way that we, we eat, the way that we produce food agriculture going forward. Um, especially with climate change as, as part of the, the, the context and conversation. So thank you again for joining us and for taking part in this discussion. Um, again, so excited to have all of you here with us and so excited to, to have Tunde with us as well. Um, so with that, I will turn over to Tunde very quick to take us through some of the, uh, the interesting videos and, and um, materials he has for us uh, before we get back to a discussion between me and Tunde on the subject that we've just uh, outlined. Tunde, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for having me. And thanks to the Alma Lewis um, Center for uh, hosting me here too. Um, I think we're just gonna watch a, like a short video that you know talked about my work here and that is gonna touch on the topics that um, we're going to be talking about. So we can play the video. My mom always says, she says that no matter how expensive bread gets, people are going to buy it. And in Lagos, bread is um, it's a staple. It's consumed by a lot of people in different varieties. There are different like tiers of, I guess, bread quality. But sort of like at the, at the bottom tier is a gege bread. And bottom doesn't necessarily mean like the worst kind of bread because the bread is delicious, but just maybe the, the least pricey bread. Um, so a gege bread as a motif is, is where, is like the starting point of some of the work that I'm doing here. The thing that has been interesting to me for the last, I don't know how many years, is economics and, and finance. So when I think about bread, um, you know, we're coming out of a pandemic, but we're still in the pandemic. We're also, well, we're always in the midst of some geo geopolitical conflict, but the one that is sort of on everybody's consciousness because of the news media and also, I guess, because of the gravity of the situation is the conflict between Ukraine and, and Russia. And that has impacted commodity prices. But even before then, because of the um, pandemic, commodity prices were under pressure from supply chain um, disruptions. In Nigeria, um, some of these commodities see pressures because of, uh, you know, geopolitical, uh, or I guess I would say geoeconomic realities. And so because of high interest rates and uh, and the need to maybe reserve um, 
or to preserve the the dollar in the Nigerian economy, there are things that happen like um, import bans, and so some goods are targeted, and you can't bring them into the country because they want to stimulate local production and all that shit. So. All of that to say is that bread, which is made from wheat, wheat, which is a commodity, is a totem in a way of um, our economic system. These are the things that I'm thinking about when I, when I think about bread. And so how do I, um, what do I want to use the bread to do? How do I um, think about bread as an object, uh, I guess as an art object now, but even to dismiss the premise of what is an art object, but think of bread as uh, as a site of, you know, control, conflict, um, global, monetary systems, all of that. And so, yeah, these are the, the questions that I've been considering during my, my residency. What is the potential for any sort of art, specifically um, one that is consumable, technically spread, what is the potential for any sort of art to really pierce and uh, trouble the um, material reality of folks who are distanced, who are distanced by technology, who are distanced by experience? I, I think the potential is it is limitless because we don't know but we know the power of food right to transform and the power of art to transform in various different ways and so there's no fast rule even watching you bake it's it takes time right it takes a lot of care and thought right a lot of hands-on right and i think of that as a is a is a almost like a literal translation of, of life and what we need to care for one another. And this gets back to this residency and the care and the integrity and the love that we put into the work that we do here. And I think we need more of that. And I think through the work that you do, Tunde, it is extremely powerful. And I know you're working through things, not only as an artist, but it's an extension of who you are. And so your lived experience, and you're sharing that with us through your, your, your baking and your making and creativity. This stuff does not happen overnight to change, right? Mm -hmm. To change in a very meaningful way. So the work that you do really, it really matters and it is powerful and it does have an impact. I think the, the premise that I've outlined is like around the bread, around consumption and production, but really around the global financial system and how it disproportionately impacts black folks, folks on the continent, uh, brown folks, folks from the so-called third world, indigenous folks, um, women, those notions that, that the bread carries, I want to um, concretize in some sort of tangible way that folks can interact with. So I think for me, the, this, the, the, the time at Alma Lewis has been about showing what the concept feels like, you know? So how can I take this concept and how can I just make it more tangible to people? I've settled on a, a couple of configurations one is this sort of like cage another is a, a performance where i'm um selling the bread on the street which is you know a common practice in lagos uh and i'm sure in other places around the world which is just like street vending um so we're doing that here so how uh, you know moving what is foreign and bring it into a place that uh, has been normalized as um, as the standard, but yeah, those are those are sort of the things that I'm thinking about.
Um, I just want to say for, uh, for context, and I, I actually just want to thank um, <clears throat> Camila and Marco for putting, putting that together and Kilolo at the, at I'm the lowest where I am. So for context, I've been in a residency program here for about two months. I have uh, one month left. And I've been thinking about, um, about bread, but specifically just maybe just, just back up. I spent like the last six months in Nigeria and this thing happens to me. Whenever I, I come back to the, to the US, I just get super angry. Uh, at everything that I see here. I just get angry at the order. I get angry at the standardization. I get angry at the quiet, you know, depending on, on, on where you are in this country. And I remember having a conversation with uh, Marvin who was a resident here as well. And I was telling him that when I come, when I leave Lagos and I come to the United States to live as well, um, I feel like everything here is fake. Um, but then he asked me, well, if it's fake, then how come you're dealing with anxiety around the fakeness, which is something that I experience here. Um, and so I think his challenge to me was to think about not whether something is fake or not fake, but like what the effects of the structures are, which of course are, are um, constructed and contrived, but they have a material impact on the well-being of, um, of folks. Um, I, the, the thing that sort of makes me angry and I, you know, maybe this is not, um, true for folks who don't, or who live on the continent and it's just true for me, is this recognition that everything that is enjoyed here in this, in, in the core being the U S and not to sort of like generalize the entire country because there are different, um, kinds of, of spaces and the relationship between wealth and and um and the, a lack of wealth exists in the us as well but um the only relationship that matters to me is that everything that we don't have say in the periphery or on the continent specifically for me in nigeria is a product of what exists here and so that's where the anger the, the anger um comes from and the systems which I hope we are able to get into um, the, the systems are so complex and so contrived and so um, and so arbitrary uh, that I feel sort of um, a little bit trapped um, about how I can articulate them um, so coming back to the bread I felt like I feel like bread is this like gray symbol um, Bread is this great symbol of uh, of all these complex realities coming together, and so I, I've been thinking about ways to like express my frustration, um, and like baking has been one of those ways. Um, thinking about how to really get people to think beyond um, what is happening, beyond what their reality is. By people, I mean people in the U.S., people of privilege here, also people of privilege on the continent in Nigeria as well, and. I also want to, to, to start thinking uh, about what my own, my own uh, um, privilege is and how you know, I can start to challenge and undo that. And you know, the question that I asked in the video is sort of like um, a question that I, that I have and I hope that we, we're able to talk about um, today is you know, there, there are really serious things happening um, on a global level, on a national level. Um, and there's also this like machine that keeps going and it's hard when you're in the machine to step outside of it to query the machine. But if you're outside of it for a second and you're able to query it, like what is the most effective kind of, of query or what are the most effective kinds of query? And you know, in the face of capitalism, in the face of um, food insecurity, in the face of um, other structural challenges, um, I, I am, so it's sometimes a little pessimistic, if hopeful that something like bread is, is effective, like bread as a tool of conversation or, or uh, um, communication or any sort of art or, um, or protest considering what the, the, the problems are. So, uh, you know, yeah, I just wanna talk about uh, with folks just sort of like how do we, 
take these really intangible systems and structures that have a deeply material impact on our lives, um, how do we articulate them in a way to create some sort of mobilization and pushback and, and, and opportunities for equity and, and, and some justice, you know? So um, yeah, Uzo, if you wanna jump back on, that'd be great. Hi, uh, cool. Tinder, thank you, first of all, for that that video that just kind of outlines um, kind of how you are thinking. And then again, for your remarks and your words uh, that I think really bring us to the heart of the challenge in terms of conceptualizing the intricate and intertwined networks between capitalism, food, energy, and, you know, we can go to colonialism as well. We can go to so many different things, colonialism, neocolonialism, neo we can go to the climate crisis and the environment, all of these things that are intertwined in terms of the way that we think about, or actually in many cases, don't think about food production um, and what we're eating and how that impacts how we are. So, you know, you've outlined quite a bit and I wanna take a step back actually and just think about the macro picture and let's talk a little bit about the relationship between what's going on in terms of the geopolitics and your thoughts around food. So, you know, to outline food and food production, you know, given the climate crisis, given shifting uh, uh, climate patterns, growing uh, areas, et cetera, was always going to be an issue. I think people thought of that as maybe a little bit of a ways off, but now what we're seeing is with a globalized food trading system with what's happening, you know, where Ukraine and Russia produce, I, I think it's something like 20 or 20% 20, 20 or 20 to 30% of the world's uh, wheat or grain exports. Um, and, and then on top of that, it's also fertilizer production as well, which is crucial for everyone else around the world and growing. You take about 25% of that offline and you have a, not a slow motion as people were thinking about before, but a high speed uh, train wreck uh, that impacts countries far afield. So yes, we see all the headlines in the news about the horrors and the disaster in Ukraine, but there's also a uh, disaster that's coming across in many other places. And it's not just the continent of Africa, we think about India as well, you know, with their, um, their climate crisis induced grain situation. And then also of course, the, the, they're restricting exports of grain for that reason, which is then also affecting the global market. Anyway, that's just to give context to everybody, brief context for what's happening, but how, you know, you're looking at that and you're thinking about the area in which you work as an artist, as a, as a chef, um, as somebody who thinks about this, like take us into the connection there, like really, and and what worries you about this? Right, uh, and I'm also curious to hear what you have to to say uh, because I, you know, you talked about you talk about the so like the globalization of, of 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 trade. I think something that happens often is that we sort of like um, take the present and we elevate it to uh, to this place. Of rarity, trade has always been global, and production has always been uh, 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 um, sort of um, wide scale. It's just it's just the, the sort of like the I guess the styles or, or the modes that have been different. Um, all of this to say that the it, it is the um, economic system in my mind that has created um, a distortion. Uh, not to say that this economic system is less natural than others, but it's, it, it is to say that there are certain things I think that we, like reasonable people have come to expect. And I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of things that are unreasonable about um, our current economic system and, and the impact that it's having on our food system uh, and on our lives. I, it's something that is also interesting about the impact of, of a, you know, say a food crisis, say wheat or whatever sort of, um, commodity is that these things are not just about who is hungry, it's about what hungry people do. You know, um, I heard somebody talk about uh, um, food shortages as a, as a biblical problem, meaning that, you know, since the time of, you know, of old, you know, the time of the Bible and the Quran and, and, and such, that uh, folks have been revolting against governments, against um, systems when they are hungry. Uh, there's, I guess, some uh, uh, 
argument to make that the Arab Spring was, was as a result of, of shortages of food. Um, so I think to your point and to what you said, I, I, you know, I, I think we're moving towards like a period of crisis, of, of crises. However, I'm, you know, kind of wary about saying that because a lot of people have, have, have been calling out crises for a while and it doesn't seem like anything is changing. It seems like we're just barreling towards, uh, you know, some, some sort of super crises and what is on the other side of it, uh, you know, doesn't seem to be like particularly delicious. If we want to go back to food. Uh, I, I don't know why I'm laughing, but I think maybe it's just your, your last uh, turn of phrase uh, because it does seem pretty dire, but you know, let's, let's talk a little bit, like what do you think is on the other side of this? Because you know, on, one, on one hand, you could argue that it's terrible. On the other hand, you could argue that this crisis that we're going into is part of, it's showing the stresses of the current system. It's showing the way that this system can't continue for much longer and that there is perhaps a remaking of this system on the other side that is maybe more beneficial for folks. We can come back to that, you know, as we speculate in the end. Um, but I, I do want to talk a little bit about, you know, in very concrete terms, um, what is, you, you spoke about what's unreasonable about the food system and also this idea of like, what do hungry people do? So, you know, let's take those two things. Like one, what is unreasonable about the current food production system that we have globalized or local? you know, at first, and then what is it that you're seeing hungry people do? And how, how, how should we be thinking about that? Yeah, I just want to say that, like, you know, I'm definitely not an expert in anything but my opinion, uh, and I, I value it highly. So how do you say that? Uh, but like, I think that what is unreasonable, like, for, for example, we're going into an inflation, apparently, sorry, no, no, sorry, we're going into a recession because we have inflation. I don't know if you have some experts saying that, well, you know, this is, uh, you know, because of high prices, because of, of, of supply um, uh, constraints, because of war, other people are saying it's because of, of, of corporate um, profits. So we have these like conflicting uh, um, uh, understandings of what is happening. Uh, but I don't know if, if we are necessarily say looking at a possibility where the impact of all the choices that are that are going to that are being made right the raising of interest rates which is going to raise debt in say nigeria which is going to in nigeria and other parts of of the continent and the world which is going to put more strain on on working class folks which is going to put more strain on resources um, I don't know if folks, are, by folks, I mean the folks, I guess, who make these, these decisions. I don't know if folks are thinking about that. I think uh, we have this sort of like a one-track mind. You know, if there's inflation, raise interest rates. Nobody's thinking about, well, is there a way to say maybe can we cap uh, um, corporate uh, profits? Can we introduce more uh, robust spending to... to, to to sort of create a bottom so that nobody falls through. So the unreasonableness that I, that I, I think about is this surety that there's only one way, you know? Um, it's sort of like the same thing that happened in the 70s and the 80s with the you know, introduction of the, the um, neoliberal systems. Like, this is what we have to do. We have to do this thing. We have to break the back of inflation. We have to export these um, policies to the continent. Um, SAP structural adjustment programs and all of these things. And, you know, I think we continuously see how they fail, uh, but yet we like continue to pursue them. And it's just like, uh, it's, a, it's a strange, it's a strange um, state of things, you know? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I think there have been a lot of arguments made about like how these, these uh, systems fail. Let me, press you or poke you a little bit, because on the flip side, people would argue that it is capitalism that has allowed us uh, for the improvements that have led to feeding many, many people. I see you smiling. I'm not necessarily <laughs> saying I'm a, I'm a proponent of this theory. I'm just saying this is, you know, what folks will say that it is like, you know, innovation from capitalism, things like, you know, like a lot of the science and research around GM foods, you know, that have led to green revolutions in certain places that have led to being able to grow certain kinds of crops, longer growing seasons, all that sort of stuff. 
that allow us to produce mass amounts of food that feed people. Again, not saying that I, I'm 100% in support of this. I'm just saying this is a counter argument to some of what you're saying. And how do you think right. about that? I think, and if you don't mind, I, I want you to answer that question too. Because uh, you know, I'm, you, you're the one who you, you first. No, it's and what, it's what, the, yeah, but I think, well, there are many responses to that, but like the one that comes to my mind first is like, what sort of system are we looking for? If one, is it, do we want to invest in uh, uh, a, um, a material um, hierarchy? Do we want to invest in concentrated wealth and concentrated uh, poverty? Do we want to invest in the continued degradation um, of the planet? Uh, because I, I don't think you have the, this version of, of capitalism without all of those things, you know? And there's another thing that I'm in, interested in, in, in thinking more about too is, this idea that, again, that we were somehow uh, production uh, um, deficient, you know, like, you know, there were all these technologies that existed, there were all these networks that existed. Uh, I think about um, certain things that, that are currently being produced, produced on sort of on a small scale, uh, but they're, they're produced um, widely. For example, Ogogoro, which is something that I enjoy, which is a, you know, a local spirit. You know, you have all of these distilleries that are, you know, that that dot the the, the creek area of, um, you know, of the the River Rhine or the Niger, Niger Delta area. You have folks in 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 the Cameroons as well, um, producing. And for as long as the production has happened, happening on sort of like a, a on an artisanal scale, like it has been these folks that have supplied, you know, countries with with their product so I, I they, you know i you know maybe more sensible people have a response that 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 really speaks to this this sort of like decentralized uh, production um but that is networked that can meet some of our needs and we also have to admit that we don't need a lot of the things that we have right now and um i think part of what pushes a lot of the, the production whether it's food or uh non-food stuff is 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 like a profit motive like how much capital can you make and accumulate and keep growing as opposed to what sort of needs um can you feed i, I feel like i'm just like fuck capitalism yeah. <laughs> but i you know i think the gogoro or you know what what has also been called illicit gin right and yeah. that for that reason uh, you know takes us to a, a, a dive into colonialism called illicit gin in many ways because it's been produced in these ways, running directly counter to what British occupiers at the time wanted in terms of food production systems, like the control. Um, you know, and, and we can think again, as you've said, about the, the larger machine. But you know, let's let's talk a little bit more specifically then about like this idea of profit motive and profit motive when it comes to food. And you know, again, I'll just to press you like a little bit more concretely, like for example, in Nigeria, there, there are two things I want to do. One is this idea of profit motive, where you see it happening and what you see the effects and the impacts are and then the second thing is like again very concretely this idea of bread and revolution which you mentioned earlier you, you know we can go back if if you are a christian you know to biblical times right we can talk about that you know and the cycle of 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 and the relationship of food and politics which i think is a really interesting thing that you bring up and you know whether we're just part and parcel of that cycle or a super cycle in this sense or if there's a way to break out of that or if this is something that you know to quote the bible will always be with us um but but let's talk about the the the, the first thing which is this idea of what what specifically are you seeing in terms of profit motive in places that you've been like the united states nigeria and how that is really impacting or skewing the way that we produce food and you know whether calorically right we can produce food on a small scale you know and and still actually support and feed a good chunk of the population just to give some sense of what's going on right in nigeria right we've got how many million kids like a huge chunk of our uh, like a, not a huge chunk i should say a large number of kids under five are stunted in fact i think nigeria has one of the largest populations of kids that are not getting the caloric intake they need and that leads to all kinds of knock-on effects going forward one of the answers to that people will say again is like well we need to improve or increase our production of agriculture we need to fortify our grains or our foods you know versus say but 
the, the effects and impacts of that could then be environmental degradation, right? You know, you're clear cutting places, you're applying massive amounts of fertilizer, which as we know, fertilizer is not just, you know, runoff and whatnot that pollutes waterways, it's also a carbon intensive process, right? So, you know, all these things are linked and connected. However, we still need to eat and we still need to feed 215 million people. You know, so I'm, I'm just interested in, in that relationship and how do you think that through in, 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 your, in your work and in your thought process? Yeah, it's a big ass question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you didn't come here for small questions, right? Right, so let's, no, let's talk yeah. About the, I, I don't think, say the food system is disconnected from you know, the economic system. It, you know, we have, there was, there's, this, there's this idea of, um, what's that shit called? Comparative advantage, you know, which is you're supposed to, you, you know, if you're a nation state, there are certain things that you do better um, than others. But if you really like examine that, that, that concept, you, you, you begin to think about, well, who, who decided whose comparative advantage was what, right? You have a situation where, you, where, you know, the, the, the global north says, Nigeria, your comparative advantage is oil. Uh, you know, um, Ghana, yours is cocoa. You, you know, so we're, we're, we're given tasks to do in the system. Uh, and what happens when all of the national resources using um, Nigeria for, for an example, when all the national resources, all of the sort of like psychic power shifts from agriculture, which is sort of like where we were, to, ec to extraction of, of petroleum, then you obviously have you know, an undervaluing of this crucial sector. You have underinvestment. And what you have is like the government and you have the private sector playing catch up. And then you, you also have the private sector stepping in to um, do really strange things like uh, speculate on, uh, you know, speculate on, on, on production, you know. So w what sort of crops do they think that they, can, they can make the, the most money for? Uh, those, are the, those are the crops they invest in. And where are they selling those crops to? Maybe they're selling it to the folks in the global north, maybe they're selling it to, um, you know, to wealthy folks also on the continent. So I think that we, the profit motive is so intertwined that we, we, can't, we can't separate it. Like a lot of what we eat and why we eat, uh, the things we do is because on the other side, um, folks are interested in, 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 in making money. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the stats that, that you quoted are really terrible around um, stunted growth of, of, of children in Nigeria. And, and I'm sure this is true across the continent. Um, I definitely don't think like capitalist or industrial production is, is the answer. Um, but I do think, and I also don't think that capitalism is synonymous with scale. You know, back to the point that I, that I, that I said, I think that there are ways that we can produce at scale but um, through a network of um, manageable uh, um, uh, um, systems. So that's sort of like how I think about it. I, just in general, I don't care what it is for me, whether it's some sort of like the web, web 3.0 or decentralized finance or whatever sort of newfangled thing is, is happening. My first thought is who is, who is gonna make money from this? And then once you start from there, like I just walk backwards. Like I don't need to understand the the logistics of how you know all of the the, the specifics of the system, but I, I know that somewhere because of the system that we're in, somebody's going to make money, and because of that, you can you know generally predict that there's going to be like a polarizing effect. There are going to be people who have and people who don't have. Um, so that's sort of like the way I I think about it. Yeah, and then so let's you know I have much more to press you on about that, but I want to turn to to some other uh, topics and also getting to your artistic uh, and culinary practices. But let's talk about this idea of 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 in some sense you know again biblical quote the poor will always be with us or in many ways this idea of like this bread revolution cycle that you've spoken of. 
Um, and, you know, are there ways to break it? Um, and more specifically in Nigeria, let's talk about a place that you just were for the last six months. How are you seeing this play out? Yeah, well, I'm seeing this, well, and I'm sure you, you know this too. Like my dad, I was talking to my dad and he was like, yo, but he didn't say yo, but he was like, <laughs> uh, he said that he was buying diesel for 300 Naira uh, uh, a liter and it's now a thousand Naira. Like that's insane. My, my a friend of mine was telling me that just, just today, he was calling me, he was like, yo, his service charge in his um, condo has gone up by uh, 300%. I think that's the, that's the right. So he's paying like about $1,000 a month on the service. So a service charge is when, you know, you pay your building manager and they give you like lights throughout the, throughout the day, right? Because, you know, we don't right. have reliable uh, uh, power so i i and then so just one more like thing there's a there's somebody that i know who sells who sells bread across the street from me in my my house uh because my mom told me this and i i wanted to find out so i i was talking to another friend and and she's a baker and she was like the price of like a bag of flour in nigeria has gone from like fifteen thousand naira bag uh last year to thirty thousand now and then this other friend who sells a gay bread was saying that the bread is still the same price. However, the, the quantity of the bread is, uh, is, has reduced. So just, you know, speaking to your point about like this sort of like, maybe we're, we're, we're reaching a breaking point. The sort of like pressure on working class folks has, has always been there. So if you're buying a gay bread at hundred naira for, you know, in, in, in Nigeria, which I guess to put it in context is like maybe 10 cents or something or a little bit more. Uh, if you're buying that, you're like really at, and if that's sort of like what you eat once or twice a day, like that's, you know, you're sort of like at the lower economic realm. And those folks have always felt pressure. But I think what is happening in places like um, Lagos, and I'm sure just across the world now is that we like folks in the middle class upper middle class are beginning to like to feel that sort of pinch and once middle class folks upper middle class folks see that um you know feel the heat so to speak from the kitchen i'm just going to bring it back to food uh you know that that's that that usually is where um when you have this sort of like you know cross class solidarity, that's usually when change you know starts to happen. And you know I, I, I'm not speculating what this change is going to look like. If it's going to be some sort of utopian uh, revolution, it could very well just be just you know, you know a reimagining of the same hierarchies that that exist. But I think without a doubt, if if pressures continue, and and you, and you saw this in Nigeria with with the re re uh, removal of the fuel subsidies, I think, um, or the attempted removal, uh, you know, about 10 years ago or, or less, where there were mass protests. Um, I think if there isn't some sort of pressure valve or, or that is unreleased, that you are gonna see um, things happening. I mean, you know, I mean, you, you know, this, this, the, the insecurity in Nigeria is crazy. Um, so like, there's, well, yeah. You know, yeah. You know, yeah. So let's let's. I know, and I, I think that's a that's an interesting point to be to be made. Um, I think the fuel subsidy thing is an interesting, and we get into the the having experienced that very very thoroughly. Uh, we get into the politics and the cloak and daggerness of of uh, political systems, but that's a that's a whole other conversation. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about um something that I think you know could possibly be a solution, right? Which is moving the content away. So we've talked a little bit about. Um, these food systems, right, and how these systems are tied to capitalism and how capitalism, in a sense, has everyone in a stranglehold and how the motive is not necessarily well-being and making sure that people eat. It's actually making sure that people or a small group of people make money. But, you know, on the continent, we eat a lot of wheat, but there's not necessarily any reason why we need to eat wheat. There are all kinds of indigenous right. grains, plants that we could eat. And I think this is something that you've brought up in conversations we've had and also in your artistic and culinary practice. So let's talk about that. Like, how do we how do we move away from some of these systems that are very much tied to profit motive um, towards things that are maybe more local, that are more distributed, that are more familiar to us? And you know, first question is why are we not engaged with these different local 
grains or are we and it's just not something that's broadcast yeah again on like a mass level yeah i think i think we are I, and i think of um uh iru which is fermented locust beans which is uh dawa dawa sumbala i believe in different parts of, of west africa it has different names and i just think about how if you want iru like iru the the, the trees are sorry the the seeds are, wi are wildly harvested so you you don't plant the locust beans tree but i've never heard of a sh of a shortage of iru before you know like i've never heard like oh we can't find iru in the market you know or uh ogiri which is you know a paste made from from something similar so um on the one hand like we are already using um to a great extent uh these sorts of natural, uh, or not sorry, not 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 natural, indigenous um, crops. I think, and you know, this speaks speaks to what you said about you know this really um, vibrant view that capitalism has brought us prosperity. Um, which, if you really examine that view too, you you find that you know like sort of like the period of greatest prosperity came when, uh, like say you know, between like after the second second uh, world war to like the 70s that's sort of like period of tremendous growth you know came when there was like a vibrant um, labor movement and you know there was there was really a you know more at least more sharing of, of profit between labor and and capital but um, the the idea of like of capital production as an inflection point as this thing that can that can uh, uh, vault uh, food production to the next level um, is probably the reason why you know we don't have um, uh, more widespread use of indigenous crops to, to feed folks is because maybe somebody currently hasn't hasn't figured out the profit motive um, you know they figured out like how to produce bouillon cubes on a mass scale bouillon cubes as a potential substitute to uh, to ferment the locust beans, you know, but they haven't figured out a way to let's say invest in locust beans production so that that is the you know more prominent ingredient um, that we use. Folks talk about cassava flour using that to make bread. Uh, that doesn't sound as delicious, to be fair, as wheat to make bread. Uh, but to your point, these other things, I think, just plain and plain and simple, I you know, investment capital isn't yet interested uh and when it gets interested um do, are we is 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 its interest going to create benefits long term and and for a large scale of people uh, for a, a wider set of people or are we going to just repeat the same system where we just happen to be using indigenous crops uh, so instead of wheat say it's cassava but we still have the same sort of tensions we still have um, hoarding, price gouging, um, and 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 the like. So you're saying it's not just about substitution, but it is really about whole systems change, right? It's about mentality change. Like you can't just say, okay, we replace wheat with cassava. We have to replace the whole way we think about the food system. Well, I, I think we have to replace the way we. I mean, we have to. I think it's the economic system that influences the food system. But and maybe this, no, maybe this is a question for you. Like I don't know. If I personally, like, I think intellectually, I believe in like revolution, uh, but I think practically, I, you know, if I think about what that means, like practically, and if I think about a future where, you know, where the the conditions of revolution are, are, are present, it, it's there's there's going to be a lot of loss, you know. Uh, so to ask you a question, maybe is. What do you think about? Because you, I, I think you're you're much more engaged in these sort of like larger systems, or, or engaged with folks who are in this, in these systems. What do you think of the prospect of like revolutionary or radical change versus incremental? Uh, is is revolution possible, and and is it revolution is it necessary? Yeah, I don't. I mean, that's that is also as you would say a big ass question, um, but. Look, I, I think the way to think about it is that there's there's a whole there are cycles of value creation and value destruction, and oftentimes, like within that, you either get a situation where you know you mentioned it earlier, right, where there are certain winners 
um, those people win for a long time think and try to make us think that certain systems are permanent or the way the world has been is always the way the world will be. And then that gets to a certain point and then it, 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 there is a revolution. Sometimes it's violent, sometimes it's quiet. And then you have a whole new set of people who benefit from that, who become the, the quote unquote producers or structurers of a new system. In the, where we are right now across the continent, I'll tell you my fear is that, you know, all of these things are very much tied to energy production, food production, value accrual to certain individuals or to a very small set of individuals. And then of course, in our case, we have a huge demographic boom that's not being served by any of these things. Like, as I mentioned earlier, we're not being served in terms of caloric intake for a very young, which leads to problems from the very beginning, you know, like just in terms of capacity, just like from the beginning, like, you know, you're stunted from ages zero to five, that impacts brain growth, that impacts all these things, right? Um, to, you know, folks all along the chain. And I worry that for the continent specifically, and of course this is for the world, we're cruising for a bruising, right? Like, and we're cruising for a very non-incremental or very massive or rapid shift in these power structures, which means that there's gonna be a time of, in, of intense chaos. Um, but out of that, I do think that you'll have a reestablishment of something that is more beneficial for a larger group of people that spreads value across um, a wider group of people. I mean, that's my hope, whether that will actually happen, I don't know. But I think that that is, is currently the path we're on. Like there is another path, right? In which people get up and say, hey, listen, we can't keep doing the things that we've been doing. We actually need to like think about spreading the pie or growing the pie or spread whatever it is, the term that you want to use, spreading the, the, the value a bit wider than a small circle of people. Again, I'm talking about Africa specifically, although you could apply it to the whole world. And in which case people are then working together conscientiously to think about, you know, systems, you know, ways of sharing knowledge, of growing new knowledge, of changing consumption patterns, of changing production patterns that will benefit a wider number of people. You know, at this point in time with the people that we have in charge, I think there's not very much interest in, in a, an orderly, I should say, shift in the way that we think and do business. But you know, you can't have a continent that has 19 million, sorry, not 19 million, but a, a good chunk of its population, half of its population under 19, um, who are not getting the things they need and expect that people are going to stay silent forever. It just doesn't work that way. You know, um, look, we've got a lot of questions yeah, and comments do. coming in. And I know that I don't want to, I don't want to take time away from the, uh, the audience. I know some people are out here uh, talking about some of the other grains uh, that you've talked about or other indigenous foods, some comments about not just on the continent, but in the diaspora, in the quote unquote new world where local um, foods have been replaced or supplanted by, by things like wheat or wheat products. Um, let's open up the floor for questions from people um, for Tunde about um, his practice, his artistic practice, his, his culinary practices, his approach to thinking about these larger systems questions and issues. Um, and and have some fun. Uh, Tinde, you're gonna be on the seat, so, <laughs> so let's let's, you're gonna take some let's do it. But, uh, so um, you know, folks, you can type them in the chat if you want, um, uh, or you can. Uh, I think we might also have people ask them uh, live if that's a thing. But keep the questions coming, and I'll and I'll put them to to Tunde. I think one of the first ones that we have here actually is um, about. You know, you've spoken a lot about uh, about your frustrations with, or I should I say, opposition to a global capitalist system that's tied to food. Um, and I think one of the questions that comes in from Nikki is, how do you resist through your creative practice? Oh man, I eat a lot of Jenny's ice cream uh, <laughs> for real. Salt the karma. Like I, I don't. I. 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 I that's the that's the that's the question. Like, how do you how do you resi uh, resist? Because it's everywhere. Yeah, I, I love what you said about. I think you said capitalism has us in a stranglehold. Um, I don't think there's anything outside the system. Um, and you know, folks talk about organizing. You know, which is which is important um, and necessary. In fact, so maybe that's one way of resisting. I personally. Um, yeah, I just, I, I just talk about things, and I, I you know, I try to, do, to do little things in my own, in my own life. I, I, I do think that there's a hierarchy that exists, and finance is at the top of that. Like finance is sort of like where capital has moved to, 
And so, you know, head funds, you know, family offices, you know, T funds, like those are the folks that dictate sort of like where capital is allocated. And I, I think the more we have folks who are thinking about, about that reality um, or thinking about changing the reality in those spaces, uh, I think that would be that would be highly influential, and and so in my sphere of influence, because I'm not you know in private equity, you know I I just uh, host or I'm on Zoom calls, and that's how I that's how I do it. Uh, you know, when it comes to, and I think we saw a little bit this in the sort of the bread making that you do. You know, I'm very interested in the the tactile uh, you know element of cooking right the tactile element of making food of making bread and what that's like for you as a as a you know whether it's a meditative process a creative process a uh, an escape or a way of connecting with you know who you are as a person and then who we are by extension as people culturally yeah uh i'm new to bread making that last loaf that i made didn't quite have the, the color that i wanted uh but it was delicious apparently um it's 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 it, it, sometimes it's, it's frustrating because the um, the dough does different things that I don't want it to do. Like sometimes it's too it's too sticky, sometimes it's too dense. So I just like I work with it. But I I I love trying new things, and um, one of the things that I'm that I'm working on is a performance which I mentioned where I, I will be trying to sell the bread on the streets in in the Americas, in these Americas, and, you know, and, and see how that goes. But um, I think in all things for me, for me, I think about anxiety, anxiety as a, as a provocation, my own personal provocation, like I'm, I get anxious sometimes making bread, and so it calms me down. Uh, but then, you know, being anxious about confronting people, not being confrontational, I mean, confronting people with bread and trying to sell the bread on the street and trying to do something that is uh that is kind of odd um uh, so cooking is it's sort of like that so sort of like dual relationships it, it presents a dual circumstance where i am anxious while i'm doing it but it also eases my anxiety as well i think we have a question from gail edwards um who has raised her hands uh can gail ask it directly or should we have her uh type it in the chat Uh, if we can, if we, okay, so Gail, if you can type your question in the chat, then I'll, I'll ask it. Um, so go ahead and do that. And then uh, I'll, I'll put it to Tunde. But Tunde, we have another question here from, from A. May, who's asking about whether you believe in consumer power, since we are locked in this capitalist system. And, you know, you know, the, there is, as you've said, maybe there is no, there is nothing beyond it. I, you know, who knows. Um, but where we often talk about the power of consumers to shift the way that we that companies do business or the way that, you know, by extension, societies, governments and whatnot think and operate. So do you believe in consumer power? And, you know, for example, in, on the continent or in the diaspora, what role do you think that consumers can play in helping to reshape this system that we find ourselves in? I think that uh, that's a great question. And I'm thinking about it right now. I don't know if I believe in consumer power as you know, if you consume the right thing, you're making the right choice. I believe in consumers shedding that role of, of consumer and taking on the role of citizen and then, you know, uh, taking, uh, taking action. So whether it's, you know, striking or, you know, you know unionizing or something like that, uh, I, I, I believe in, in that power. I don't believe, you know, this sort of shuffling of, of spending in this sort of beverage to this other sort of beverage is provocative enough to um to change to yeah to change much um yeah the, 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 and there's this you know, coming back to the united states there's this like weird statistic that is often thrown about it says you know like black americans have x amount of spending power that if they could just use it the right way like it's crazy because there's a difference between like what you need to spend, like that spending power includes spending money on food, on gas, on your on education. Like 
those are not choices that you that are those are choices that are very much constrained by a reality. And I think the sort of the way part of the way the system, the capitalist system works is that you have to keep you have to keep making money to spend it on the things that you need to survive. Whether those things are like socially constructed or or material, materially uh, um, necessary, and so spending power or you know if consumer power is spending power is not a substitute for like dislocating from the system temporarily or, or um, permanently. Mm. I mean, I guess that's a good point. I really like what you're saying about this idea that it's not just you know spending power isn't it's not necessarily discretionary spending power. Yes. <laughs> It's about like, yeah, the essentials. And as we all know, with inflation, um, especially with food, right, the cost of essentials is going way up. So does, does that necessarily reduce people's spending power? And is that by design, um, you know, that, that we have to think about? Um, so from, from uh, uh, another uh, attendee, I think, you know, there, you know, this is a good one, sort of whether capitalism could ever be capable of factoring the unaccounted cost of producing food. So we talked about this a little bit earlier, the actual environmental cost. So, you know, I, I heard this said, and I think it's a really, really good point that energy is food, not just in the sense that we eat food to gain energy, but also that for every ton of grain, for every like bushel of apples or whatever, there is there's a carbon cost to that, right? Whether it's through fertilizer or transportation or whatnot, but we don't think about that at all, right? When you go and buy your banana at the supermarket or whatever it is, right? You're looking at it and you say it's, you know, I don't know, it's like, you know, three dollars for an orange, let's say, depending on what city you're in. If you're in New York, that could be the cost. Um, you know, you're not thinking about what goes into that. So how do you how do you think about that? And do you think that we can ever account for it? And if we did account for it, what would the price of our food actually look like? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting um, question because I think about. Um, I actually did hear this too about say a box of cereal. That you know the actual, you know, if 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 a box of cereal is like five five dollars, like the actual cost of the cereal is like a couple of cents, and everything else is you know the energy, the the packaging, and all that stuff. And so our, the system is connected to you know these larger um, cost pressures and, and, and such. I was listening to folks talk about um, um, extraction of natural resources, petroleum, and how, you know, they're, I think about $20 trillion uh, in so-called stranded assets. And so the opportunity to tap, you know, the oil that exists, um, that is say, Twenty trillion, uh, twenty trillion dollars. Um, if you if you do not do that, so if you leave the oil in the ground, say you you know if you, yeah, then you you you're foregoing twenty trillion dollars. There is no incentive to leave the oil in the ground. Currently, you know, like it, it just like it doesn't exist. Like there is no incentive to. Uh, there, there's incentive to charge more to customers. But there's no incentive for producers, so the folks who hold capital, who invested in the production, there's no incentive for them to raise their production costs when they can externalize those costs. Um, so I, I don't see it. I don't see it happening. Um, I think, I think, so like consumers on the one on the one side are always they are more um, adaptable in terms of of pricing and and costs. Like consumers would pay for what they need if they have the money. That's just like what the fact is, uh, but if they don't have the money because you know they're not getting paid enough uh, because people who are producing are cutting investment and so there's unemployment and people are scared for their jobs so they don't want to ask for more money. If if all of those things are happening, then of course people are going to rebel against uh, um, um, price hikes. So I think the owners has to shift to production and not just the producers but the investors in. Uh, the, the, the capital investment in production, which is only interested in profit making. And so as many costs as you can externalize, as many costs as you can, as you can leave unpaid, you will do that. Um, that's my answer. Yeah, so this brings us maybe to a question that Martha has brought up, which is about this, I mean, it's a little bit about the, the, the production side of things. And you'd mentioned earlier, 
again, to go back to the Ogogoro example, um, sort of small producers in a distributed fashion producing enough capacity for the whole entire nation. And Martha is asking what, you know, to, to dive a little bit deeper into ownership structures that you've seen, you know, whether we're talking about cooperatives or whatever, and what kind of things exist and can we build essentially a functional non-extractive food system. So she mentions farmer cooperatives, community seed banks, um, you know, as potential options, but things that are not necessarily financeable within this capitalist system. Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, I think spiritually, I fuck with co-ops. I think they're a great idea. I, I, I guess the question is, um, you know, can they scale? You know, like how do we, and by scale, I don't mean, you know, uh, are they viable? I mean, are they viable against the current system in that, you know, there's, there's this tension between, uh, you know, I guess, corp corp corporatively owned and, and you know, traditionally owned, um, uh, whether it's farms or, or, or businesses in, in general. So I, I'm all for, for, for that, but I think it might be putting the cart before the horse, if that expression is correct here, um, to focus on that without like, also or first focusing on the sort of like larger economic system because you know you know depending on the on the size of the farm the cooperative you're still going to need to buy certain things right you're still going to need to buy a you know a, a tractor say or some sort of some tools you're still going to maybe need to be connected to the internet you're still you're, you're still connected to a larger system that is um that operates on a different premise uh, and so until or unless we begin to change what I heard somebody call the operating system of uh, of our economy, I think you have these individual pockets of of um, success, uh, but like on a sort of like a wide wide scale, I'm not sure how effective they can be. Mm, there, you know, we have a little bit more time, and so I want to put two questions to you. Actually, I'm going to do the second one first um, that just came in, and then we'll we'll add it. We'll end on your idea of what is what is effective praxis within the food system. But um, this question, which which comes in from uh, Njafi, which is, what is the final goal of keeping all the children fed if there is no role for fed <laughs> children? Which is a it's a tough question. I don't know. If I, I think I don't know how I feel about that question. But it's a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a good one and i mean like you know it's it sort of maybe is a, a bit more of an existential question right which is what is you know why are we here right i think you should take that question actually because yeah i mean i'm not i'm not a philosopher and this is your show <laughs> today, so I, I don't know i i look at people i uh in lagos i would just see all, all these kids like going to school walking to school um and i'm like do they know that there are no jobs? Like, do they know like these like kids who are five? And then I look at these adults who are going to university because I stay by Amyaba College of, of Technology. And I'm like, do they know? But like, there's such a commitment to, to, to education. It's like, it's, it's improbable to think that, uh, that, that they should, like folks should just maybe stop doing that and, and, and focus on stuff. So if you think about education, uh, the same way you think about food, uh, I think everybody should, everybody has the right to uh, quality food and, and healthful food. Um, but, but it does, you know, there is that question is like, if you, if we have, well, maybe if we had welfare people that weren't interested in, you know, in playing this sort of game, just, you know, you wake up, go to work, come back, sleep, wake up, go to work, come back, sleep. If you, but if people are just well-fed, and they were not interested in the game, then there's a purpose in, you know, in feeding people. Uh, but uh, uh, I think it's, it's like, it's, it's, it's hard when the options are limited and there's just so much, you know, there's just so much dire distress on the continent. There's so much dire distress in the United States with working class people and it's gonna get worse because of people are, are going to start losing jobs. Investment is going to shrink. Like it's only going to get worse. And, and folks, by folks, I mean the folks in power are not thinking about anything else but like breaking the back of inflation again and like ruining communities and lives. 
That's crazy. Yeah. Um, so. On a happy note today. <laughs> Uh, no, but I, mean, I, I just want to chime in here, and I think part of you know the response to to uh, Njati, I hope I'm saying your name right. Your question is, I think this is maybe two things. One is it's an affirmation of our right to exist because we are here. I think that's the first thing, and then second, this speaks to the need to develop a philosophical or a system or or cultural systems that are in in ways disconnected from the predominant one that drives how we operate, right? Which is what Tunde was saying go to work, come home, go to work, come home, all in, in the support of production. But th the question I have is, has anyone, have we on the continent, have our folks offered a, a different vision of what the purpose of life is about, right? So in a capitalist system, the, it's productivity, profit motive. What is then our, what is our, our, what is our essence, right? What is our drive? And that drive can't just be related to making money. It has to be something else. But I don't think that we've sat down to articulate it. I don't know that we've done the deep historical work to look at what those motives were before. And we're just imbibing in many ways, this idea that everyone has always been a capitalist from the beginning of time, which I don't necessarily know is true, but it is kind of the way that we all grow up because of the, the way that we're taught to, to engage with the world. That is a, an, awesome and fascinating question and a much larger one for I think a, a really intense debate about the philosophical underpinnings of how we think and how that's related to everything. Um, Tinde, I'm going to come back to you really quickly and ask you, okay, in terms of your practice or practice, like what is it, what is a, what is a, uh, what does that look like in the U.S. food system uh, on a small scale? In other words, uh, as uh, Diego has asked, what can an individual do? What can a baker do in the community that they serve to move progress forward? And I, you know, I think this is a good way to end on a, on maybe a slightly hopeful note, even if the situation is pretty bleak, because there is collective action and mass change, and then there is what you can do in the immediate surrounds. Um, and that's not to say that you know, I, I, I am one of those people who's not about like, oh, every individual should just do it, and the world will change. I think that that is, you know, again, a lie in many ways we've been sold. But there is working with the people who are very close to you and trying to change things around you um, that does provide some sort of hope and relief, at least for your immediate community. What does that look like for you? And what do you think people can do? Yeah. Um, who am I to, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, who am I to like tell people? But I just want to go back to something that you said about you know, the continent not articulating sort of like a, a strategy. I think. There's something that, that um, you know, this tension between personal responsibility and like structural um, reality. And there are arguments that have been made that Africa as a continent is the product of a larger structure, structural reality. And we, we're just playing a part in it. And if you look at when, you know, just even the, the, the creation of the different nation states in the, in the continent, with the Berlin Conference and the you know the time of, of that period that created the states, but even in recent history, if you think about just where we were post in independence or prior to independence, and sort of like how the focus was like development uh, and how it shifted away from development with like I said earlier the SAP the SAP the Structural Adjustment Program, it, you know the neoliberal agenda sort of took over the continent. Like that wasn't. I mean, there were, of course, people on the continent who benefited and who continue to benefit extremely from, from that position. But like ultimately, there's sort of like the need for uh, American or the or capital from the global north to move, when, you know, speaking about co co colonialism, to move to the continent wasn't something that we were necessarily clamoring for, that we had an agenda. You know, if I think in the 70s or maybe in the, in the, in the mid 60s, you had the, the, the Lagos, the, the Lagos uh, conference where all you know, bureaucrats, from, or bureaucrats from all the, most of the countries, if not all in Africa came and they, they laid down an agenda for change. Uh, that agenda was, um, I mean, it's, you, know, you, you can read it. It was countermanded in, in part by what the, the IMF did in response to that. Uh, and then subsequently what happened with, with the structural adjustment program. And so I think that now maybe our histories or our memories are short because of just the, the sort of like 
how dense the situation is and how just really it seems like where we are it's hard to look outside of what is going on because things are, are are so hectic but i think that there, there are multiple folks and there and, and there and there has been like a long spirit of wanting a different kind of um of system so i i, I just want to say that you know that I, sometimes i don't even think that we are in control on the continent um but then to your question which is supposed to be lighter uh about um, my practice here and what people can do individually i honestly think and this is crazy but i think that somehow we need to try and pierce the financial sector like we need to um this one fellow told me that what matters is the allocation of capital and so what that means is um you know where is money being spent like who is building or where are the new buildings coming up the the new infrastructure uh the the you know the, the new farms like who, who is investing in in new things uh or in old things and who who is making the decision to move capital to certain places and to whatever extent that we can personally influence those investment decisions those capital allocation um, decisions then we can change how how things are i think until then i think we're scratching at the surface i think we are um yeah we're just like you know howling at the moon in a sense uh because that is that that is what it comes down to it comes down to money and how money is spent and who controls how how money is spent um yeah that's what i think about that. Look, uh, Tinde, I think that's a good place for us to wrap up. And I know that there's so much more. We've had a discussion that ranges from food to economics to philosophy. Um, and thank you so much for bringing us to this place and really showing us the connections between all these things in the act of bread making or in the act of feeding people. Um, that what we do is not just is not just about eating. It's not just about about consuming. It's really about the connection um, of all of these things. Tunde, brilliant mind uh, and provocative mind, and thank you for that. And I want to thank everybody who joined us um, virtually here, um, and especially to Mofad and to the Alma Lewis uh, uh, folks for co-organizing this conversation with us. Um, so I want to ask you all to please stay tuned and updated. Uh, with us here for our work at the Africa Center, signing up for our newsletter and following us at theafricacenter.com and all of our social media platforms. Um, and you can also, uh, for those who want to stay in touch with uh, MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink, and Alma Lewis, make sure we're going to post in the Zoom chat how you how you keep in touch with those folks. You know, we have an exhibition on in partnership with the Museum of Food and Drink um, called African American Making the Nation's Table, curated by the indomitable Dr. Jessica B. Harris. Um, for those of you in New York, please come in, uh, see that. And we wanna hear from you what you think about this and your ideas on how we actually make this system this world better for everybody. Um, Tunde, you are amazing. Thank you so much for joining us and for bringing your ideas uh, into this space. Thank you, Uzo, and thanks to MOFAD, Africa Center, and Alma Lewis, thank you. All right, everybody, enjoy your afternoons, evenings, uh, nights, and we hope to see you back for either a digital program or in person at the Africa Center. Um, thank you. <laughs>